sure it was my fault. So how are you doing? Good. It's nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too. And I wanted to start off. I've been thinking about you since you've been experiencing the fires in Portland. You're in Portland right now. Yeah. And in Oklahoma, people are so far away from the protests, so far away from the fires. So we really only hear about it on the news. And I think that's interesting. It's so different experiencing something firsthand and witnessing it as opposed yeah. to just uh, reading about it on yeah. news outlets or seeing about it on your TV. How have things been there? It's, uh, yeah, just, it's, everyone's really anxious. It's kind of like one thing on top of another. Um, but I think with anything, and when I lived in Oklahoma, you know, you turn on the TV and it's talking about a tornado, right? And it's, but you're kind of sitting at home going like, where's the tornado? Sometimes it's just more sensationalized on the news. So the things that I feel are the smoke because we can't go outside and the pandemic, but the protests downtown, you can feel really far away from them if you're not there. And they definitely have been very focused on in the media um, for good and for bad um, reasons. But if you want to, you can feel very far away from that stuff. So kind of similar, but, um, and I was wondering the same thing when the, um, the rally was in Tulsa, cause I was watching that, you know, from here, like every single moment and going, what does it feel like to be there versus right. being here? Um, but I think it's, it's kind of similar. It feels, you know, here I'll say, it's just like, what else can happen? You know, I'm just like going, okay, November is going to come around and then we'll see what happens. And just kind of one thing after the other, my thing is mostly the kids, you know, my son's like, why is this the sky yellow? You know, what's happening with all the smoke and just a hard time. I think everyone's having a hard time. I was driving back from Kansas two days ago, um, back to Oklahoma and you could see a line of smoke uh, really? across the sky all the way out here. Yeah. And then I looked at a smoke map and it's uh, covering parts of the Midwest also. So yeah, it's, it's really sad. It's epic. And if people want to say global warming isn't real, they can just come out to the, the forest fires out here. It's really our backyard. I couldn't even hardly see all the way across our backyard, you know, yesterday. So yeah. it's, tough. it's tough just with this whole new world that we're living in, but you know, I just be grateful for what you have. That's what right. I keep to myself, you know. And we're speaking because of your involvement with the Center for Public Secrets in Tulsa. And yeah. the idea of journalism and of experiencing something or being far from it, what your brother Leroy Chapman did um, when he was alive and working is he was looking at the things that people didn't want to look at, you know. Like yeah. you said, you can live your life in Tulsa and... Uh, go around without uh, discussing or thinking about or seeing the things that he wanted people to see, but he made that his job. And so how has the center continued that legacy? Um, well, you know, after Lee passed away, it was interesting. My sister and I have been talking about this, just the different relationships that we had with him. And when we came, you know, to Tulsa for his memorial, just, we were just like, oh my gosh, all these it was pretty amazing um, what happened and what I learned about Lee at his memorial and kind of beyond. I knew Lee was doing a lot of history recovery specialist work, um, but I don't know if I really understood the impact that he was having in Tulsa and on the community. And I learned so much about that um, while I was there. And so many people said, Hey, you know, we, without Lee, there's a big piece missing in terms of what our community will experience. And we need to keep some of that. How are we going to keep some of that going? So, um, the idea with the Center for Public History, uh, Center for Public Secrets, is to um, really kind of nurture and inspire that next generation of history recovery specialists, because the work doesn't stop with Lee, and it's not about replaying all of his work, which is amazing, and a lot of it's still not out there. So it's a great platform, the center, to really showcase his breadth of work, yeah. but also what are the new stories that are out there? And so we really want to make sure that we have a platform for up and coming journalists, up and coming art, artists, um, researchers, photographers, to be able to tell their stories in a way that's meaningful to them and bring that to the community. There's a lot more to tell. Yeah, that's great because I was, I was involved with this Slam Press as a journalist um, several years ago now. And Lee was kind of the master. You know, you looked at the articles that he wrote and when you arrived, they were like, okay, read this, read this, read this. And they were all, 
it was all stuff by him because he was really digging deep and I think doing what any investigative journalist kind of would dream of doing. That's the kind of work that he produced. And um, you guys had an event in February that sort of brought out the archives. And I don't believe we met there, but I was in attendance. And it, it showed uh, sort of his research and stuff like that. And people could dig through that and tell stories. So what did you guys learn from that event? Well, one is we've been super fortunate. The folks at this land, Stuart and those guys have just been so helpful in pulling together all of the content that he had, you know, put together during his time at uh, this land. So that's been really great. Um, but also just with some of the other um, articles, actual, you know, um, documents that he had been collecting, some of his reporting and, you know, um, spirals of information and, you know, notes and things like that. It was just really great to kind of see it all like laid out you, on all those tables, you know, and really kind of looking at it through the lens of music and history um, and art and the things he was doing there. I think for me, it just showcased just all the different things he had passion around. And one of the things that threaded through everything was Tulsa, you know, whether it was like focusing on Tulsa artists or the things that he did in Tulsa. Um, with all the different screen printing and, you know, art installations and the people that were there, I thought was really great too, you know, coming out. What we learned from that was there's a lot of people that are really interested in working with us, which is great. We had people like Vanessa Hall Harper there, which was awesome. Um, Greg Robinson was there, you know, Lee's old cohort, cohorts, Western Dotty, Dan Reif, you know, that whole Scott Large, that whole group, which was great. Um, Christy Williams and uh, Chief Ahmad, I'm going to say it wrong, but he, it was just like this really dimensional group of people that put them all together. You're going to get something very dimensional and diverse. Um, and like I said, so many other stories to tell. So we're hoping that that group, you know, continues to talk and bring together ideas that we can actually put forward at the center. And the pandemic has sort of put a hold on things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was funny. I was there in February and my husband was like, you have to get home, the pandemic sitting. And then Oregon got a case before Oklahoma ever came close to it. But And then next door to you, yeah. Seattle was one of the first places in the U.S. to really get Yeah, hit. hot spot. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but you do, you guys do have the website up and running and there's a library of uh, some of Leroy's work and other people's work uh, in the same vein. But what sort of programming do you have planned for the future? Lectures, yeah. events, things like that. Um, I don't know how much you can reveal or how much is set well, in stone. Um, a little bit um, and not a lot set in stone. We have some things um, for sure that we're looking at. But I think between now and the beginning of the year, we're working on smaller events um, with different artists. And then uh, we're working with something with New Tulsa Star to kind of get us um, going. We have to keep the events really small, as you know. Um, and also offering up the center to folks who do want to have meetings and have um, events and community forums. It's a place where we want the community to feel like it's theirs as well. So there's always an opportunity there. But really from January on, we'll be addressing the centennial of the massacres. And we really want to do it from a way that will be unique um, because it's going to be obviously a huge focus um, everywhere in Tulsa. But we feel like we've got a really cool and different way of looking at it. Um, that will make people want to come and see it kind of from the the perspective through the lens of you know Tate Brady and then kind of passed into what's happening present because there's still a lot of you know um, impact that it's having yeah I think for us we're so familiar with um, the work that you guys are doing about how would you explain it to somebody on the outside like what's the core mission of the center yeah. the core mission of the center is um, to promote the real Tulsa and beyond. The real, real Tulsa is what we talk about. Um, and we do that through immersive experiences. I think the thing that will be different about the center is it won't be just uh, art installation or a gallery. It will be programmed with speakers, um, with different um, community-led events. And the thing that's really important for us too is to not tell other people's stories, but to allow the folks that are impacted the most to tell their stories. I mean, we are just really a platform for that. Um, I think because Lee was such a um, collaborator, it's very natural that that's going to happen. We're just the person or the entity 
to collaborate and bring people, uh, different people on to tell those stories. Um, and so that's what we want to do in terms of just kind of the mission is really get deep into some of those. And to your point, it's the good and the bad and the ugly of the history of Tulsa. Um, same thing with the content of Lee's articles and work that he did. Um, but really, we want to make sure that we do um, get that next generation of history recovery specialists interested, you know, in what's going on. So you're more or less the facilitators of creating a space and a platform where people can have these sorts of conversations yeah. rather than coming out saying, this is our mission or, right. yeah, yeah. Our mission is to bring the community, like have the conversations and just keep them going um, with things that are important to the community, mm -hmm. you know, at the time that they're important to the community, so. And so much has changed since Lee's passing that I think, um, he was really influential in starting such as the renaming of the brady arts district uh the brady district to the arts district and the work that there's been a mass graves commission for a long time but that work hasn't started until um just this year in earnest and uh there was something else oh um and his involvement with the arts and uh he had the first real well, the first underground Larry Clark show in Tulsa. Yep. And then Philbrook just had the first official. Uh, yes. Not necessarily endorsed by Clark himself, but they had permission enough to right. do so. So, I mean, so much is happening that it, it seems like his spirit really lives on in the kind of work that people are doing. Yeah. I wonder, you know, if he was still here, one, I wonder what he would think about this whole new world we're living in. I mean, he'd have a lot of content, I think, to yeah. uh, work with. Um, but I do, you know, it. it's hard to not have him here to see what's been happening, you know, and to know that he was, you know, kind of ground zero in a lot of those conversations. Yeah. And can you talk about um, your sister's involvement? In yeah. And, um, so sister, yeah, and go ahead. there's also a um, sort of private in, invite only event uh, towards the end of September, but yep. I can see hear yep. some about that too. Yeah. yeah. So we have um, a really small board of directors right now. Um, a lot of folks that have just, you know, been friends with Lee for a long time, some great artists and some great um, colleagues of him. My sister's primary job is she's the executive director of the center and she's been doing a great job. She moved down there from Texas to be a part of this. Um, like I said, we've been working on this for you know five years. It's just been kind of one thing after another, you know, start, stop, start, stop. But she got down there and so she's the executive director and she's working really closely with Western, who's our creative director um, of the center, coming up with the different programming and vetting ideas. Um, so many ideas are coming through the site. We actually have a um, area on the site that says if you have a story or an idea, please submit it and we'll work with you on seeing if we can bring that um, to the table for the center. So she's been doing a great job. The small private event, they'll be able to talk to, I think, more in detail. Um, but it's really, again, introducing the idea to a very small group of people and actually having some conversation about what should we be doing. You know, we want the involvement of these specific people there. Um, the thing that we're really trying to balance too, and everyone keeps saying this is, Lee would not want to be exclusive. Like this isn't about it, exclusivity. You know, he would want to invite all, which we will, but I think us getting up and running a little bit, we're gonna start small with a few folks and then we'll continue to grow um, into more, more and more people getting there. Plus it's just the, the COVID outbreak doesn't allow you for big gatherings. And I imagine you can only handle so much work. You know, this this isn't a um, huge org organization with lots of funding. This is really a grassroots movement. It's, uh, it's something very, by people for the people. And Yes, it's very grassroots. And in terms of funding, you know, we're really trying to not take funding from different larger organizations because we do feel like we want to make sure that we're not beholden to any narrative um, that may or may not be out there that we're able to speak the truth that we see. Um, sometimes some of that funding comes with a little bit of strings attached. So it is very grassroots. Yeah. Um, and there's always opportunity for folks to donate and in lots of different ways too, though, volunteering, submitting stories. To your point, we don't have a big staff at all. Yeah, I wanted to follow up on that. Anybody who wants to get involved 
as you said, can submit a story, but also can give yes. uh, in monetary value or time. I'm sure Absolutely. you guys will need volunteers. And yep. Yes. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Uh, we were going to have our big grand opening um, kind of kickoff event in August. It was going to be a great music kind of festival block party that would have just been I think more of a like fun way to get it started versus going straight into the content of something like the massacre, which is very serious. So it was really going to be around kind of Tulsa music history. Um, and we were lining up volunteers and getting everything ready. And then it was kind of like, we're still not ready from a COVID standpoint to have that large of a, a gathering. So yeah. lots of work to do still. And I feel like the whole center for public secrets too, and has been, I want to say it's just been a long time in coming and I'm fine with waiting until it's the right time. But, you know, we started in 2016, basically coming up with the concept that was actually Lee's concept. He started the center for public secrets in 2008. So it was great because we already had all of that foundation to work off of. Then we started to get the, the place on sixth and Peoria, um, not easy to get permits to open up a space like that. It took us a very long time to get that building done um, and then getting the website up. So we've been making some progress. For me, it's a little bit slower than I would like, but it's appropriate to make it go in the right way. And the space is very cool. I can't wait for people to see that. It's like, yeah. it just has such a unique feeling. It seems like a cool space to hang out. I can't wait until it's actually like a research center with a library. Yeah, absolutely. And right now too, another way to get involved is we're actually um, kind of allowing people to use the space for a donation because it is a great space. So if people want to have a meeting there um, or something like that, a small gathering, they can use the space and there's just a, a donation, a way for us to raise money for the center. That's great. I, I was just thinking that there aren't very many spaces like that in Tulsa where you can um, hang out and have a meeting. Or there are, and they're very expensive. You know, yeah. The only free one that comes to mind is the library, and even right. The, I yeah. Know, I don't know if they're open right now for that. Yeah. 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 But yeah, so that's and that had always been kind of one of Lee's things too. I remember he would spend so much time in the libraries with the computers because it was a place free place to go, you had Wi-Fi, you know, and his idea around the, his bookstore and things like that was he just wanted people to come in and be comfortable, have a cup of coffee, hang out, you know, and that's what the center will be like on a daily basis, to your point, with research and different um, exhibits and things going on. So people should feel at home. So then um, what does the future hold and when can people expect to uh be able yeah. to really get involved with the programming. I know that everything uh, depends upon COVID. And yeah, well, we are looking, you know, really at, you know, January, really starting a lot of work around the centennial. And so hopefully programming will start in February. We're gonna be working with um, students and schools around how we're pulling that together, kind of back to our vision of the history recovery specialist. Um, and telling probably a nine month long story around that through the lens of that. So I feel like that's really gonna be our bigger thing. But for us, you know, and the whole time we were doing this, um, when I'd come to Tulsa, I would sit down with this kind of, you know, group of the same people, Western and Dan and Scott Large and kind of just this group of people would always be like, what's it gonna be? And they said, well, once you make it, it's gonna start to create a life of its own. So we're really kind of just looking for that. If it's for the community, by the community, the community will tell us like what it needs to be and what we need to be doing there. And that's really what we want to do. Well, I'm just really excited about the work you guys are doing and I'm happy to have you on here and promote the center. And I can't wait until we're able to add events to our website. And Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, well, thanks for reaching out. I'm very happy to be here and I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. It's going to be fun and you'll continue to hear from us. Yeah, thank you for talking to me and stay safe with the fires. It, I was talking to you uh, yesterday or the day before and it looks like things are getting a little bit better there. So. Yeah, a little better. And thanks again for calling and just reaching out to see if we were doing okay. That was very cool of you. Appreciate yeah. it. Okay. Thank okay. You. Yeah, you have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye.